Amen. Christ is not alive. The Bible says we are of all men most miserable. But I'm not miserable here today because he's alive. Amen. Doesn't mean you're not going to have sorrow and heartache along the way, but there is a day coming. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, please. 2 Corinthians in your Bibles this morning. Read a couple of verses, pray, get into the message for the morning, Lord willing here. We will have the Lord's Supper afterwards. Won't take very long to do, but be good to do. Do this in remembrance of me. For every time you do it, you do show the Lord's death till he come. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Verse number 1, would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly. That's the Apostle Paul saying that, not me before I preach. And indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. So there is a right jealousy to have. There is a right anger to have. And God displays that and describes it in his Bible. But the Apostle Paul through the Holy Ghost says, I'm jealous over you. Talking about other saved folks with the, the right kind of jealousy, godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Thank you, Father, again for making salvation so simple. Father, I can say that now because I'm on the other side of the empty tomb and the empty cross. For many folks, it's very difficult for them to see that they would even need a Savior. But that's our job to go tell them, Father, of what you've done for us and the marvelous saving power your son still has to redeem their lost soul. But, Father, as we gather this morning as your children through the blood of Christ, I pray you'd help me through the power of the Spirit of God to preach as you'd have me to preach, that you would take over the service and minister to hearts and minds and ears and eyes and everything, Father, as only you can. Father, thank you that now that we are saved by the simplicity in Christ, it's also really a simple Christian life you call us to live. Father, help us to see that today as the darts are thrown about us and at us by the wicked one. Father, help us to uh, wage a good warfare till we go home to glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Have a seat, please. I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm a, I, I hate people that... See, you, you thought I was going to stop right there. You're like, oh, he hates that. That's a good preacher. Good job right there. That's real Christ-like of you. No, I'm going to say, I, before the Snickers came, I hate people that make things look easy. I mean, don't you hate those people that are just like, they don't come around very often, or when they do come around, they're like, oh, you got a leaky roof right there. And they go up and like in three minutes, they have it all done correctly. Or your pipe is busted, or, you know, a faucet's dripping, and they're like, within two seconds. And they, they don't appear to have anything complicated in their life. Everything to them just comes easy, comes simple. Uh, my brother Frank is like that. My brother Frank, I mean, he's, he's, a little, he's a little shaver compared to me. But, I mean, Frank could pick up any implement, a, a tool, a hockey stick. My brother Frank is the best athlete in our family, and that's t coming from somebody who played pro ball. My brother Mark would made it to the majors. My brother Frank was still playing baseball up until he was 59 years old, striking college kids out like nothing and playing second base when he didn't pitch. I, I'm just saying things came so easy to Frank. But he's still a little shaver, that's what I call him when I see him. But I'm just trying to downplay him because he's so good at everything. And that just ticks me off. Haven't you ever met people in your life that are just really good at reading the Bible? Don't you wish you hear somebody read and you're like, I'd like to be able to read like that. Man, I wish I had his recall. I wish I knew, and you're like, man, why does he make everything so simple and look so simple? When it's really not. That's the Christian life I want to preach about today is that why do we make the Christian life so complicated? You just read right there, the simplicity is not just for salvation, folks. The simplicity we enjoy now that we're saved, because remember, the context is a chaste virgin. If you're here saved today through the blood of Christ, you're part of the body of Christ. You're going home one day by death or rapture to be forever with your Savior. That's a done deal the day you got saved. You're eternally secure. You don't have to speak in tongues. You don't have to baptize. You don't have, you're saved and washed by the blood of Christ for all eternity. But the context is, why are you guys making this so difficult now that you've been saved so simply? Why are you making this Christian life so difficult? And, and I understand that he says, I, I fear lest by any means the serpent, as the serpent beguiled Eve. And I, and I get that. The picture is, you know, how did the serpent disrupt 
what the most perfect thing could be on this earth. A male and a female in a garden. No animals attacking them, no cancer, no gamma rays, alpha rays, and all that stuff from the sun, no earthquakes, no pestilences. They had, folks, they had one thing to do. Don't eat that tree. Is that complicated for you right now? Oh, I don't know. I don't want what tree? What color is the tree? What day is it? Do you want me to take care of it every day? Do I trim all the... No, stupid. Here, it's simple for you. I don't, don't worry about all the other trees, but, but Lord, there's a pear tree over there and a peach tree, and, then, and there's a partridge in the pear tree, and what do I do with that? No, I want you to take care of that tree, and that's the one, don't eat of that tree. Just stay away from it, man. How complicated could that be? I mean, I mean seriously, seriously think about it. right now you're thinking, well, Lord, uh, 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 preacher, you just don't know my life now, and I know where you're going to go with this, and you just don't know what I'm going through. No, you just read a Pauline epistle through the Holy Ghost that says, this thing is not supposed to be as complicated as you and I make it. And what happens is when you see a big job, you've, ever, you've heard the statement before that, you know, how do you eat an elephant? You eat it by one piece at a time. Well, you attack Christianity the same way. Same way you have a big job at work, you have a project that's doing maybe 30 days or whatever. You don't just jump in and kill that thing in one night. You start pecking away at time, 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 an hour here, hour at home. And, and pretty soon before you know it, the project is done. It started out complicated, but really became simple when you looked at it. And I, I look back in the, in the context here is that the serpent came along and he presented to Eve what she thought was something better and something more simple than what God said. You know what, if you really eat this tree, I mean, you've seen this tree. It's just, I mean, look at it. You already know it's pleasant to the eyes and it's good for food. And why don't you just go take some? I mean, what's the big deal? You're not going to die. Don't, don't worry what he said. Yeah, but that's the start down a slippery slope where you start negotiating with the devil right there. When he starts you to get thinking that things are more complicated than they really are. Well, you'll be as gods. You'll be just like, the, you know, the gods and my buddies that are flying around right now. And you can run. Up, no, yeah, yeah, but all he did was say, just don't eat that tree. I, can, I mean, there's other beautiful trees around here. Are you from? He just said, don't. Yeah, but I mean, what's the big deal if you just take a little bit? And you see what comes, starts to come in? Confusion and complexity over one simple thing. That's what happens in your Christian life. Oh, I got to pray today. Oh, and I got to fast today. Oh, and I got to hand out some tracks today. Oh, and I got to go to work today. I got to get gas in the car. And, I gotta... and before you know it, you're swirled around with so many things that are complicating your life when God said, I just gave you one thing to do today. I want to keep it simple because you know what? It's easy to get corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. It really is. I'll show you something, a couple of contrasts before we get into it. Go to, uh, go to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. The simplicity that's in Christ. Oh, I hate people that make things look simple. I, I really do, man. Get things done in a heartbeat. I'm like, I, I watch the guys sometimes, when I, uh, not sometimes, but every, every few years I get my tires done, and those guys can do tires, four tires, down at Maple Tire. That's not a plug for them, it's on the internet, but if you go down there, just tell them Dave Brown sent you. But Maple Tire, <laughs> they, can, they can do those tires, I'm seriously, four tires, balance, mount, I mean, in like, and there's two of them. One guy jacks up the car, gets off, takes them off, the other guy goes in, takes it off the, the rim. It, it's unreal. They're done in 30, 35 minutes with four tires in one bay garage. And I'm like looking at it going, you've just made that look so easy. Well, you know why it's easy to him? He's been doing it for 40 years. But he doesn't let complex things get involved. Jack up the car, take the lug nuts off, roll the wheels over. Simplicity, one thing at a time. You know what Christians do? Oh, I, man, I got to read my Bible once in a year at least this year. I mean, I got to do that. And Oh, man, I got, I got to give, and you know, I got, and you just get swirled around with all the complexity of things. That, folks, that's confusion. That's the devil working on you. He's trying to get you off the one thing, the main thing, the simple thing God's given you to do. We'll look at it this morning, but I want to set the precedent. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. The Bible says this in verse number 33, 1433 of 1 Corinthians. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. While you're right here in the same chapter, go over to verse number 10. Same chapter, same book. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. You know, the voices coming from all over the place, your boss and your wife and your husband and your kids and, 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 and the person at the grocery store, and all these voices come at you, and they all have signification to them. But it can lead to confusion, and God is not the author of confusion. God's voice is crystal clear, and it's right down the pipe in that book. Folks, there's a great warning here today. That don't let your life get so spooled up and get off the main thing. You know what the main thing is for you and I today? Lost people getting saved through our witness. You can't save them. And to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Doesn't that sound pretty easy? Well, what about this? No, no, you're getting off the simplicity that's in Christ. You're getting dragged down the proverbial rabbit hole. You're getting sucked up in the vortex. God gave you, as a saved person, one thing to do, two things to do. Go witness to the lost, but I want you to be perfected and edified and get involved in the work of the ministry. That's what I gave you to do. Yeah, but what about, you know, I understand all the things, but do you see where, see where your mind's going right now? Well, you just don't know what's going on with my kids and school and COVID and work and, and Zoom calls. That is gay, by the way, Zoom calls, whoever invented that thing. I hate that thing, man. No, go show up. Put a mask on, whatever you got to do. But anyway, that, that's a little sidebar right there. But that's all confusion, folks. Uh, if you want to see confusion, come out on the street sometime with us and try to talk to somebody about Jesus Christ. And they pull in what they've seen on YouTube and what they've read in a book and what they've heard over here from a preacher and what they've seen from a priest. And it's just, swir- no, God gave you one thing, Jesus Christ. You know what the devil says? No, it's Jesus plus and Jesus. That happens to save people. You get off the main thing so easy and so don't I. And God said, I, I didn't send that your way. I didn't send confusion your way. I, I didn't send that voice that's dragging you off down another path. I made this thing so simple even a caveman could do it. Go with me to Acts chapter number 19. If you guys didn't get that reference, good, you're not watching TV. You remember that back in the day, that caveman that was on there for the Geico commercial? And it says, so easy, a caveman can do it. And this guy came out with a big forehead and the beard and all that stuff. Oh, good, it's, I'm glad you didn't see it. Acts chapter 19. Good, it's better. You're probably more saved than I am, and that's good. That's a, that's a, that's a blessing. 19 out of Acts. Acts 19, pick it up with me in verse number 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he went into Macedonia, two of them, that, uh, so he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. And the same, uh, and the same time there arose no small stir about that way. A certain man, a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with workmen of like occupation, and said, "Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but also throughout all Asia, this Paul had persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods, which are made with hands." So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed, in, uh, rushed with one accord into the theater. When Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, w- which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused. And the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. They got so confused they didn't even know why they were there. Do you know why you're in church this morning? Or are you confused? Have you been taken away from the simplicity that's in Christ Jesus this morning? Well, you know, when I get out of here, I gotta go get some food. When I get out of here, I gotta gotta cut a tree down. When I get out of here, I gotta go. No, for this time, give some time to the Lord to deal with you because anything else will just bring confusion into you. And God may be dealing with you about something this morning, and the serpent comes right in and says, Yeah, you know, you got things to do. And hopefully this hour goes away quick, or two, or three, or whatever he braces for. And maybe it'll go by quick. Those are voices coming from outside that are taking you away from the simplicity. This crowd is so messed up. you got some shouting over here for Diana, and some that are actually telling Paul, don't go into the theater. And then another group says, Paul, go into the theater. Well, which one is it? You mean to tell me you've never had that happen as a saved person? You're getting a voice over here, and counsel over here, and advice over here, and a preacher over here, and a, and a text over here, and you're going, which way do I go? You know who has it? The simple answer from Jesus Christ. The serpent will pull you in multiple ways and get you confused. So I want to give you some stuff this morning to help you be anchored down in this book. Go to, uh, go to John chapter number 9, please. Number 1. I like to say this as we get started this morning to cut through the confusion and to help you see that this is not the the Christian life is not as complicated as we make it. Is that number one? I don't know much in life, but I know I'm saved. <laughs> I, I don't have to know every verse on the deed of Jesus Christ to know that He bought me with His precious blood. He took me from darkness to light. 
He took me from the kingdom of, and power of Satan unto the kingdom of his dear son. I don't know a whole lot, but I know I'm saved. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? You tell me you've never doubted your salvation before? You've never doubted whether you're a child of God or child, not a child of God? Well, where do you think that voice comes from? You just read it. It doesn't come from God. God's not the author of confusion. God's not the one with the voice coming in your ear saying you ain't really saved today. You know what you do? Devil, you know what? If I'm not saved, then big deal because I'm going to hell anyway. If Jesus Christ's blood can't save me, then good. I'm just as good in hell. Let me have a good time. But the blood of Jesus Christ did save me. And I don't, I don't know all of the verses in 1 Timothy 3.16 and John. I don't know them all, but I know this. I know what God did for me. He saved my, saved my soul. I'll show you the example of that. Look at John chapter number 9. Remember the blind man here? The blind man gets healed by the Lord. Look at verse number 13 with me, folks. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Verse 17, they say unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, they're talking to the parents now, saying, Is this your son whom ye see, say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. We went to Ancestry.com and paid $99.99. But, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had, already, uh, had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this man, they're talking about Jesus, is a sinner. You know what the blind man says? He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. I don't need to know if Jesus Christ is a sinner or not. I don't know if he has his doctrine right. I don't know if he healed. I just know one thing. Let's keep it simple. I can see now. You remember the day God took the blinders off your eyes? Remember the day God saved your soul, man? Remember how simple that was? It was hard getting up there, but when you got saved, you're like, why did I do this 20, 30, 40 years earlier, man? And God saved you and transformed you, made you a new creature in Christ. He regenerated you on the spot. He quickened you who are dead in trespasses and sins. What, and you know what? You, did, you didn't know, oh, what are the seven baptisms? Could you give those to me before you get saved? Do you know the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, by the way? You know, because I'm not going to lead you in the sinner's prayer until you know those. No, I'm going to hell. I don't want to burn. I'm taking the way out, Jesus Christ. And you know what? That's how simple it was. You say, well, should I keep living there at the cross? No, you got to move on to your Christian life. But what a great place to start. I don't know everything about the Christian life. I don't know what that, all that book says. But you know what, one thing? If it all goes away, I belong to God. I'm in his family. If you're saved, you do too. That's what the blind man said. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where he came from. I don't know his lineage. I don't know, I don't know if he, he committed sin. I just know he put clay on my eyes and I can see now. One thing I know, I can see. Simple, man. Don't, don't you find things uh, get better when you narrow down your list to one at a time? Have, have you ever heard this before in the corporate world, the work world? Uh, multitasking. That is a... Cr it, that, um, what's, okay, well, that's, what's the Hebrew word here that I want to use? <laughs> that is a, that's a lie. You know what multitasking means? You're doing many things under 100% level and not sufficiently to get the job done right. Well, I can do, mul yeah, if you really look back, you probably cut some corners to get that other two or three or fourth job done. You know what you do? Let me get the first one done 100%, move to the next one, get that one done 100%, move to the third one, get that one done 100%. Oh no, I got, I got to wash the windows. Oh, and I got to do the floor. And then, oh, the dishes are in the sink. And, no, one thing I know, I was blind, now I see. Yeah, but you know, the devil, the devil comes along, just like we read where we started, 2 Corinthians 11. Well, you know, yeah. You haven't witnessed in a long time. You, you sure you're saved? Yeah, I mean, you haven't, you haven't really prayed in a long time either. Are you sure you're really saved? You know what? 
uh, devil, I do know that one day the Lord saved my soul. I don't know all these other doctrines you're bringing to my ears. I don't know all the voices you're bringing to cause confusion. I just know this. I know the day I trusted Jesus Christ and he saved me in an instant. And that's never going away. And by the way, see in the lake of fire as you get kicked into it. What's the first thing right here? What's the one thing to keep it simple so you don't get out of the simplicity that's in Christ? You're saved and you know you're saved. Number two, move on with Philippians. Philippians chapter number three. Philippians chapter 3. You'll see a theme, Lord will, and I hope the Lord does that for you. You'll see a theme as we go through this. Philippians 3. I want to read a few verses at the beginning, and then we'll, then we'll, we'll skip down. Verse number 1 says this, Philippians 3.1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Why do you go over the same stuff all the time? Because it'll penetrate a little bit easier and better the next time it comes around your way. That's the way you learn is repetition. The Bible says, verse number two, beware of dogs. <laughs> Kathleen already brought that up in Sunday school. Dogs are not good in the Bible. That's true. They're not good, except for my dog. The, it's, hidden in, it's, hid, it's hidden in the, that's it, that's John, Johnny's waving his hand back. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. What things were gained to me, those I kind of lost for Christ. And so he gives his resume here. Now, skip down with me. I'll show you something neat. Go to verse number uh, 12 with me. Not as though I had already attained, either were made perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Getting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Number one, I don't know much, but I'm saved. That's the one thing I know. That's what that man said. I don't know it, but I know one thing. You know what the Apostle Paul says right here? He goes, you know what this one thing I do now that I am saved? Don't let my past haunt me. You can't let what you did before you got saved haunt you. I'll say this, you've got to let go of some stuff the right way biblically. I'm saying if you did somebody wrong, you've got to biblically take that, uh, that, that forward approach and get that right between you and a brother or sister, whatever the case might be. You can't just skip out if you owe somebody money or that because, well, I'm saved now. No, you've got to take care of it, but you know what? Don't let that thing haunt you. You know how many saved people go through life with baggage on them, mental baggage, spiritual baggage, emotional baggage, and it just weighs them down. I'm not talking about, seriously, uh, we, we used to say stuff to the, uh, the, to the guys up, up of jail ministry. You may not get saved out of this jail, but you'll get saved through it. Now, I don't mean jail saves you. Jesus Christ saves you. But he may, just because you got saved doesn't mean you get pulled out of jail. You smash some of these cars as a saved person, guess what you got to do? Pay the insurance bill. Well, Lord, I'm saved. No, you got to take care of it. But you can't let that event haunt you the rest of your life and say, I can't do anything for God. I'm so low. I can't do anything. I don't. The Apostle Paul said, you know what the one thing I do? And this man started all the New Testament churches. That's where I get our doctrine from. Romans of Philemon, through this man, he goes, you know what, guys? Of all the things I could do and all the things I could do today, this one thing I do, simplicity in Christ. The one thing I do is, I can't let what I did back there haunt me today for Jesus Christ. You do know that your sins are behind his back, right? You do know that the only, thing, buddy, the only person that brings up your past is the devil. You know who the accuser of the brethren is in Revelation 12? It's the devil. I mean, we do a good job of accusing each other too, but I mean, he's the primary accuser of the brethren. We're just, sometimes we go back and join the old family and the old father. But you can't let that thing jump on you like this big old 900-pound gorilla and weigh you down. If there's things you've got to take care of, go back and make things right, ask for forgiveness, 100% do that. But once that thing is gone and under the blood and washed away, move on down the road. A, a Christian sitting in churches and uh, they did me wrong and they did me wrong and he did me wrong. And, and, oh, okay, man, for real. You never done Jesus Christ wrong. You never done another brother in Christ wrong or another sister. I, 
okay, let me just turn let me look at myself. you never done anything wrong to another Christian? Yeah, come on, man. We've done, we've done each other dirty many times. But you make it right and you move on. But you know who comes around and says, I remember what you did. Yeah, you know what? This one thing I do, I'm forgetting that thing and I'm moving on. The only people bearing up the past are the people who want to keep you in chains. Because you know what they do? They come back and say to you, oh, I remember the way you used to be. I'm not like that anymore. It's 30 years ago. You still go to your high school reunions. Get over that stuff, man. Oh, I was back in the day. I was looking all good. Yeah, you ain't looking like that anymore. You're looking like a sack of concrete. Get over yourself. You know, you put your Facebook picture up there, and that's back when you're 18. You know, showing the gun show. Showing, come on, man. You don't look like You look like a bowl of oatmeal. Get over yourself. Get over yourself. Facebook and Twitter, where you go to live forever as a youth. You know what? Put the past behind you. Let's move on for Jesus Christ. That, it's a simple thing, man. Well, I like to go back. You know, don't, don't stop trafficking in that foolishness. It's an anchor emotionally and mentally to you and spiritually. What, Paul, don't you have to go preach today? Yep, I, I, I do. But you know what this one thing I'm going to do? This one thing I haven't apprehended. I haven't, I'm not everything that God wants me to be in Christ. I, I'm not, my Christianity is not perfected. But you know the one thing I can do today? Just forget that stuff. It's in the past, and let's move on. I'm, I'm, I'm in a race. Now, how many people run a race like this and go, oh, let me go back. I forgot something. Oh, no. You, oh, you know what? i got to get another mile. Oh, you know what? I left the stove on at the house. What, what are you doing? The race is that way towards the finish line. But what do we do? Make it complex. devil comes along and says, oh, no, you got other things to do. No, I've got one thing to do today. I know I'm saved, and I can't let my past haunt me. I can't. Keep on going with me. Go to Mark, Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter 10, please. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, pick it up in verse number 77, please. Mark 10, verse uh, 7. Did I say 77? Yes. Wow. They got to have some drug testing in this pulpit, man, seriously. Uh, Mark 10, verse 17. I'm sorry, that's my fault. Mark 10, verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callst thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Yeah, he's standing right in front of him. <laughs> thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I observed from my youth. That's not a bad answer. Look what the Lord does. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. What's the one thing holding you back today from serving Jesus Christ? What's the one thing holding you back from doing everything God has told you to do? I do not know what that is. This man is standing in front of God Almighty, and he asks a very pointed question. Good master, what, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord says, why well, cause somebody good? And he goes and he says, if, if you will enter into life, do these things. And that man said, I've done them all. And the Lord said, you have. And he, he loved him. But you're missing one thing. Just one thing. One thing keeps him from eternal life. Now, if you're saved here today, you're already, you're already on your way to glory. Amen. You're already on your way to glory. But you know what? There might be one thing you haven't given up yet that the Lord is tapping you in your heart about. And I don't know what that is. It's just between you and him. Isn't there a sin that doth easily beset us in, Roman, uh, in Hebrews chapter 12. Isn't there one thing that kind of we like to hold as our little pet that we don't want to give up? And I, I understand that you, you do have sin and that you, you, you're going you're, you're gonna to have that happen. I, I get that, but why? It's usually because I want to cling on to an idol in my life or I want to cling on to something that is more important to me than God if just be brutally honest about it. And then, you know what the one thing for this man was? Was his money. I don't know if money's your problem. Maybe it is your problem. I don't know. I, I don't know if money's your problem. Maybe it's uh, anger you won't let 
go up. Maybe it's a situation that happened in work that you, maybe it's the way you're, one thing you got to do. You see where this is, the message is kind of going? We have one thing, you're saved. One thing, forget those things you're behind. One thing, what do I need to give up to walk forward with the Lord? And what did, where did our pastor start with? I fear less your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Uh, simplicity means it's easy. It's one thing to do. Well, here's another one thing right here. You, there's something in your life you need to give up. I'm just telling you right now, and I don't know what it is, but there's something that's holding you back from loving Jesus Christ and serving him the way you should. And you know it, and God's been dealing with you for years about it, but you won't get it right. I don't know what that is, but you ought to get it right. And it's not just because we're having the Lord's Supper. I would preach this anyway, because this is the way God deals with me. Well, Lord, I've got all these other things. No, I just want to talk to you about one thing. Just one thing today. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? Lord, you know everything. Do you love me? I just, I'm asking you one thing. Lord, you know everything. All right, I'm just asking you one thing. Why are you getting so upset? Because it's one thing you and I won't give up that will stop and hinder our lives from serving Jesus Christ to the fullest. Do you know why misery comes in the Christian's life? Because we still hold back something that God says, let it go. One thing, and you're miserable because you just want to hold on to it. You want to have your own bale bush, your own bale idol, your own, your own high place. And God says, I want that out of here. Get it out. But Lord, you know, I just told you one thing to do. Don't eat of that tree. But Lord, what could it harm anybody? Don't eat that. I gave you one thing to do in the garden. What's wrong with you? You don't listen? Same to you today as a Christian. Same to me as a Christian. One thing. This man's on the cusp of eternal life, and he won't give up his riches. You're on the cusp of going to the judgment seat of Christ and giving account of your life. So am I. It'd be a shame that one thing kept you back from getting the gold, silver, precious stones, and all those crowns that God has laid up for you. Be a, I, I don't want to see saved people lose their rewards. Ah, ha, ha, they finally got what they're... No, oh, no, 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 man. I want to see you get as much as God wants you to get up there. And he's laid it out. But it's usually just one thing that you won't give up that keeps you from getting all that. Just one thing. Could it be that difficult? You know if you start this wall right here, and this wall is not perfectly plumb, and I know that because of the way that, that uh, banner is over there because it's got bubbles in it and the way it's laid out, it's not perfectly clear. But you know if you started this, this wall and you're laying it for the first time, you want to be dead square on right at the beginning. Because if you know you're even like a 30-second off and you go 20 feet, you're way, way off. Well, you got one thing in your Christian life that's holding you back. You know what that does? It affects several other things in your life. And yet God says, I didn't make this complicated. I didn't make this difficult. Let's just hit one thing at a time. Well, what's that one thing this morning for? I don't know what that is. But it would be a good time that we are having the Lord's Supper. you got to examine yourself, 1 Corinthians 11. You, you're saved, you're saved, but you ought to examine your walk with the Lord. That's, that's 2 Corinthians 13. That's all over the place. You're supposed to examine yourself. You know, the, that doctor checkup you take once a year, twice a year to go in and make sure everything's going all right? Well, how come Christians don't do that with the Lord? How come you don't run yourself through Dr. Jesus? And he gets the eye chart out and the hearing test and the scale. And he says, you know what? You got that one thing. You know, you got high cholesterol in your life. Eh, but you know, Lord, you know, I like to eat what I like to eat. You know, right? It's just one thing. Just take the cholesterol, man. And get, we'll apply that spiritually. I got high blood pressure. You know, I like things with salt, and you know, I don't get a lot of exercise. Yeah, but if you just get that one thing under control, if you just give that one thing up, you'd have a great life, man. Probably get another five, ten years on your on your on your ticket. Well, it's the same with safe people. One, he's not willing to give up one thing and he misses eternal life. What a sad thing that would be to see that man at the great white throne judgment because he would not give up his wealth. Crazy stuff, man. Go on with me, please. Psalm 24. I'm, I'm sorry, Psalm 27. Psalm 27, please. This one thing I know, I'm saved. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind this one thing I do, I need to identify what's holding me back. It doesn't have to be a money issue. That's not even the point of what we just went through. It's always just that one thing. And, and God said, I fear. 
that you'll be pulled away from the simplicity that's in Christ. Well, living the Christian life is difficult. No, it's difficult because I choose to make it difficult because I love me. God said it's not that difficult. How can these men and these women go through the stuff they went through? Tortured, burnt, sawn asunder, hung up, bags of snakes on their head, buried up to their shoulders for the high tide to come in and drown them out. How could they do that? Because they gave up everything for their Savior. Well, that'd be hard to do. Not if you're sold out for Jesus Christ. Not if you're not confused. Not if you've been pulled away from the simplicity that's in Christ to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and body. Strength. Look what the Bible says in Psalm 27 with me. Psalm 27 says this, a psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord. David, really, you don't, want to, you don't desire anything more? Uh, house? Uh, it, no, I just want one thing. I, I'm keeping it simple. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. If you read the previous, pat, the previous verses, David in, his, in this psalm is saying that, man, I, I, there's a whole host of enemy around me. And, and, and they're all fighting against me, and they all want to do me harm. They want to wipe out my family. They want to take the kingdom, and they, 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 they want to trash uh, the glory of Israel. And you know what he says? He doesn't say, you know what? Let's go out and count up the spears. Uh, let's check the ammo dump. Uh, let's make sure the horses are fed. You know what? Do we have enough horses? How about the chariots? Have you guys greased the wheels lately on those chariots? No, he says... One thing I want to do, I just want to be in the house of the Lord. I just want to inquire after him. David, you got a host encampment against you. You know what? Because distractions can pull you away from the main thing. We can't meet. It's COVID. we got to sit six feet apart. Joe Biden's president. Did you see what they're doing with the homosexuals and the perverts? There's enemies all over this man. A host encamps against him. You read some of the hosts in the Old Testament, they could be a million Egyptians. It's huge what a host could be. I don't know what the host is specifically right here. I didn't, I didn't go back and look it up in the, in the Kings and Samuel and all that. But let me tell you something. Uh, the host can be used as a distraction to you and I. It can pull you away from the one thing. David, they're about to come slaughter you. Your wives, your, yeah, but you know what? The, I've got just one thing to do today. Well, what, what's that, David? Go out and practice with your sling? What, what's that? Get your, spiel, uh, your, your shield polished up? No, there's, i got one thing to do. I'm going to go spend some time in the Lord's temple. David, you're about to be run over. Yeah, but you know what? I want to keep it simple. I just want to ask of the Lord. And you know what happens? Distractions. Uh, we, we can't go out and hand out tracts. It's too cold out. Oh, we can't out go on hand. It's too far to drive. Oh, I can't get involved in ministry. I mean my time. Oh, you, your time? You mean the time that God bought when he saved you? You mean his time, don't you? I can't give that kind of money. Well, what, I mean, what do they even do with it? I don't, you know, it, it, it's distractions from the one thing we're supposed to do. Folks, we're lights to shine in the midst of a crooked and dark nation. And I'm not talking about the uh, middle of uh, crooked, perverse nation. That's not just America. I'm a child of God. I'm not an American. That's down the road. A long ways down the road. Imagine you being a saved person in China and saying you're an American. Well, look at my Bill of Rights. Ha! Here comes a tank coming. Get in front of it. I'm serious. People are, uh, saved people think Christianity runs through America. We're a joke. Let me tell you, we are a joke compared to the world of Bible-believing Christianity. We're a joke. We're soft. We're lazy. And we're pulled aside by milk prices going up and gas going up. What do you mean gas for your second car or your third car? Or how many milks do you need? Two for this fridge and one for the one out there? Or that, oh, that's actually the freezer full of meat you got. Distractions, man. This man's got 
untold amount of enemies coming after him. And he goes, you know what? I'm just going to focus on one thing today. Uh, I need to go ask the Lord for some stuff. What's got you pulled away, Christian, today? What's got you distracted? Fox, CNN, where the polls are going. You know what? Next year, we're taking back the House and the Senate. How's that been working for you just out of curiosity? I'm talking to children of God, saved. That's who I'm talking to, saved. Yeah, well, you just talk. No, I've talked like this for 30-something years. That's why people don't like me. Yeah, he's, yeah, Brother Bird, yeah, that, he's the one, the one guy that does like me right over there. You know why? Because I know I'm going to stand in front of him one day. And I'm just trying to get you guys to see that we're going there to tell him everything we did. Do you even care? Does it even enter your heart and your mind you're going to stand in front of your Savior one day and tell him the stupid stuff you did? Does that even bother you at all? No, I don't, you know what? I don't know. Are they going to turn over Roe versus Wade? Who cares? Stop fornicating, you pig. Then you won't have unwanted pregnancies. Merry Christmas. There's your celibacy, celibacy message. You know how you cure Roe Ro versus Wade? Um, mm -hmm, mm. You know how you stop Roe versus Wade? You stop going out and being a pervert. You see, I don't even care, I don't even care about that. What do you think about that? I don't care. How about you get saved and you only think about that stuff? You see where, you see, but you get pulled aside because the enemy is great at distraction. You know, look over here, and somebody over here is going to hell. Oh, get involved in this over here, and a Christian needs some help. Go over here, and oh, come on, man. David said, you know what? This was only one thing I'm going to do. That I'm going to inquire of the Lord in this. Time. No, I'm just going to go spend some time with him. David, come on, man. Really? And that's where we're at in Bible-believing Christianity today. Everything's important. Everything gets complicated because we're getting off the one thing, man. The simple stuff. Last one. Amen. Isn't that good to see? You could have said amen right there, but you blew it, man. That's your last, that's your last shot. Go with, uh, go with me over to Luke, please. Last one. Luke chapter 10. Did you notice the theme through this? One thing. You know what happens? You know what happens when you get away from doing one thing and doing one thing well? You get confused. See what happens when you get confused? You get away from simplicity. Where is simplicity found? In Christ. You see where, uh, Lord willing, this is where this is going to go. Maybe, may, maybe not... Uh, hit you now, but folks, I mean, honestly, it, honestly, isn't it just difficult enough to get up every day sometimes? Isn't it difficult enough just to read one chapter a day? Isn't it difficult enough just go, just do it? Yeah, it is. But what happens is you start getting pulled aside. and not, No, I just need to do one thing today. What's that one thing? I need to do one thing at a time. I don't want, com folks, I hate complex. When the kids used to get sick, man, it used to, and not, not just because they got sick and, you know, I... I felt bad for them, except when they were coughing and keeping me up, and I wanted to kill them. I'm just saying, but I mean, I, I, don't, I don't like complex in my life. I don't get how some of you folks like Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and, that, and, blah, blah, and a text and boom. Blah, blah. I'm like, no, I got enough to do right now. I have one thing to do. I don't like all this. Some of you folks are caught in a whirlwind of just madness. I can't deal with it, man. I get a text, and I'm like, oh, no. I, I don't get it, man. I need simplicity in my life. I need a simplicity that's found in Christ, not just for getting saved, but in my everyday life. And the Apostle Paul says, you've got to watch out. You can get pulled away from the one thing God's called you to do today. Go on with me to Luke chapter number 10. The Bible says this, verse number 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary had chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. You know what the most important thing for you as a saved person is today? Is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Was anything Martha was doing wrong? 
Is it wrong to clean the dishes? Is it wrong to cook? Is it wrong to do the dusting and the vacuuming? Is it wrong to do any of that stuff? No, it's, it needs to be done. But Jesus looks and says, you know what? There's one thing that Mary chose to do, and that's the better of the things you could have done today, is spend some time with me, right at my feet, comforting you, teaching you, admonishing you, maybe spanking you, exhorting you, just loving you. And that's what Mary, Mary, you know what? The Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, the creator, our savior said, she chose the better part. Of, uh, uh, could, Mary, seriously, we've got 12 people coming for dinner. We need 12 settings. You need to put the, you know, the, the small spoon to the big spoon. We need to work through soup, dessert, and appetizer. And they got to get the linen out. And we got to make sure it's pressed and nice. And could you get the candelabra, please, for the middle of the table? And we don't serve pork. You guys know that. And, and, and then here we, and here we go. And Martha's not doing anything wrong. But the God of glory says, there's one thing that you could have done. And Mary chose the better part. Was it necessary for Martha to do that? Sure was. Is it necessary for you and I to go out and hand out tracts? Sure it is. But it would be much better if you spent time with Jesus Christ before you went and did that. Wouldn't you want his counsel and his open door when you go to talk to somebody? Wouldn't you want his advisement and his wisdom as to what path to take and who to talk to, what store to go into, what, and who to hand a tract to, who not to hand a tract to? You don't get that unless you spend time at his feet talking to him, fellowshipping with him. Folks, it's one thing to be saved, but that communion with the Lord. Folks, there's a reason why only two people walk with the Lord in the King James Bible, Noah and Enoch. Isn't that weird? I, out of the thousands of people, thousands of saints, Old Testament, New, there's two that walk with the Lord. Don't you think that's kind of a premium thing to do? And I know the 12 walked with them, but I'm saying specifically by wording, Enoch and Noah were the only two people that walked with the Lord. Out of all those people, Lord? Yeah, because those are the two people that chose to come alongside me. Folks, God doesn't move. God does not move. I move. You move. He is not, you know, playing hide and seek with you. He's in one spot at the right hand of the Father, and he wants to just have some time with his kids. And Jesus says right there, Martha, Martha, you're, you're cumbered about and you're troubled, but this one thing, Mary, man, what's better, hand out gospel tracts or spend some time with Jesus Christ? According to the Lord, what she's doing right there, what's more important, getting ready for all the people to come over for dinner or spend time with the Lord? Man. You see right now the gears are turning. <laughs> they turn with me too. But the Lord says, I didn't make this complicated. I didn't make this hard. We just saw five one things you can do in the Christian life, one thing at a time, to have a great walk with the Lord and a great testimony, a great witness, and a great relationship before you go home to see him. That's the five one things. Let's pray. Brother John Stavol, can you pray for us? And then we'll have the Lord's Supper. Amen. 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 All right. Have the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11. I'm not trying to rush through it, but 
go to 1 Corinthians 11, we'll do the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper in the New Testament, when the Lord, uh, we covered this all back in June, the Lord's Supper, as you see it progress, and as the Apostle Paul has given it to us, the primary two ordinances are bat water baptism after you're saved and the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 11, you're going to find that there are brethren involved, saved people. They have been baptized. Paul says, well, you know what, I, I, Christ didn't send me to baptize. He, that's 100% correct, but he did baptize Guy, Stephan, and all that. So baptism shows an, an outward testimony of an inward faith, what you believe. It's, a, it's not the... Uh, putting away of a filthy conscience, or, 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 or excuse me, putting away the, uh, the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God in 1 Peter. So saved, baptized, and that's, that's what 1 Corinthians 11, where you're at in the Pauline epistle, because remember, I'm not, I'm not re-preaching what we went through before. When you go to Matthew 26, they're celebrating the Passover. That's a Jewish feast. The Lord takes that and gives that in 1 Corinthians 11 for us to celebrate. Uh, Judas did eat. He was a devil. So I'm just saying, you got to be careful about Matthew 26. It is instituted and all that, and it's a force after the Lord dies. But 1 Corinthians 11 is where you get the major teaching for the Lord's Supper for the New Testament church. Pick it up with me in verse number, verse number 20, 1 Corinthians 11:20. 20. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So they're not, they're, they need some instruction on how to, how to do this thing correctly. For in eating... Verse number 21, for in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, the Lord, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he, betray, he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye is oft. That means you can have the Lord's Supper as often as you want or as not often as you want. You're not breaking any traditions. You're not, you don't, there's no set time to how many times we do this. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death, that's the remembrance, the crucifixion, till he come, that's to show he's alive. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So there's a stern warning that you need to take account of yourself and examine yourself as you get into this ordinance we're about to partake. The Bible says, verse 28, but let a man examine, him, uh, examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damage to, uh, damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, many sleep. Sleep in the context is death. Uh, there is an improper way to take the Lord's Supper. It does affect the, the Lord's body is not his body. We're the Lord's body. You taking the Lord's Supper improperly, un, unworthily, that affects other believers. That's what that's talking about. It's not the, the Lord's not coming back down here in a body and sitting here saying, let's sit down and have the Passover. No, it's done improperly by each individual believer. It affects the Lord's body. It has an effect on other, say, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And honestly, it does cause death. I know Judas was not a saved man, but what did Judas do after that night that he went out after he betrayed the Lord and ate? What did he go do? It did lead to his death. I know he's a devil. I know he's not in the body of Christ. I, I know where I'm doctrinally saying it, but that's a great foreshadow. It does affect, it could affect people physically. 100% it could. The Bible says this, uh, verse number uh, 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. That's where the examination comes in. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. You know how you know you're one of God's kids? He whips his kids the right way to get you back in line. You're not like the world, where the world, the devil, just lets the, the, his kids go wild. You know what the Lord says? Smarten up, and he'll whip you back into shape in a good way because he loves you. Look what the Bible goes on to say. Verse number 33, wherefore, my brethren, there it is again, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. 
so this is for Bible, uh, for, for saved people. Baptism is part of it because Paul did that in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. It's the outward act of an inward faith. So if you are saved, I don't, we don't do membership here. If you're, part, if you're saved, you're part of the Lord's body. You are a member of God's Son's body. But you need to examine yourself, so I'd like to take just a couple minutes, honestly, two, three, four minutes, just to get alone with you and the Lord, not, not necessarily you and your wife, it's just you examining yourself with the Lord. I don't know if there's something, maybe it's in your heart, and your mind, maybe you've got something against one of the brothers, I, I don't know, sister. It's a good time to get that thing right. Instead of being the guys at the table that sat there and went, Lord, who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the greatest? Lord, who's going to betray you? That should not be the case for us. So let's take, take a couple minutes and pray, and uh, I'll get back up, and I'll call a couple guys up, and we'll get the bread and uh, the grape juice going. The Bible says in 11.23, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Brother Kenny, pray for the, pray for the bread, please. Giving the Lord thanks for his body that was pierced for us, and then you can distribute it, please. Amen. Willingly, you know, you shed your, your sinless blood for us. We just do it in remembrance of you and how we take it on in our lives and we give it to others as we have received it ourselves. Right? We know it. Come on, give it to our healing, our friends, and we want that.
The Bible says he is wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. That body took a beating, boy. Something else. Brother Bert. <clears throat> the Bible says in this verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Go ahead and pray, Brother Bert, for the... Heavenly Father, thank you for shedding your blood. Amen. You fought to wash away our sins. So thank you for being willing to do this blood for us. So thank you for the promise of your return. Lord, Amen. You are so important to remember that your death is truly coming. And uh, so thank you for that privilege and your great love. Yes, Lord. Amen. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in Matthew 26, they sung a hymn after he left, some sacred hymn book. Sing one, uh, one line of saved by the blood. 247, please. 247. On the fourth, say by the blood of the crucified one, all hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. I say by the blood of the crucified one.